please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Christopher Patton, to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, come on, there's coffee. I have to have some more coffee. Let's talk about the five problems we all face as marketers. Uh, the five V's. There were four and then there was a fifth one. IBM came up with the first four of these. The first problem we face as marketers is a question of volume. How much stuff, how much data we are facing. Right now, this year it is estimated as a civilization, we're going to create about 30 zettabytes of data. Now, a zettabyte's a really hard number to get your brain around because it sounds made up. It's not actually. If you were to watch Netflix, when you watch a Netflix show, you're showing, you're looking at about one gigabyte of data for every about half hour you watch. If you started binge watching Netflix 55 million years ago and didn't stop for restroom breaks or eating, you would get to one zettabyte today. That's how much just one of these is. So a zettabyte is huge. And what's going to happen in the next seven years is we're going to quintuple that number. 120 zettabytes of data alone will come from all these lovely little devices that we're wearing, the lights in the ceiling, the projectors, your shoes, everything will be connected and will be creating a massive amount of data. So that's our first problem, a problem of volume. We know this intuitively as marketers. Our marketing, when you get your Facebook results, you get 14 tabs in a spreadsheet just to look at one Facebook page. Right? That's a ridiculous amount of data to try and make sense of. It's no fun. Our second problem is a variety problem. As Dennis showed earlier, this is what happens in 60 seconds on the internet. Just 60 seconds. There, in 2017, there were 70,000 hours of Netflix watch. In 2018, 266,000 hours. That is a lot of Netflix and chill. 452,000 tweets in last year, 481,000 tweets this year, 990,000 swipes on Tinder last year, 1.1 this year. I'm still guessing mostly left. Um, none of you use Tinder. <laughs> But you get a sense for just how much information and the variety of information. Do we have systems that can accommodate all these different formats? A swipe is pretty simple, but the amount of voice search that we do, not nearly as simple to process. The amount of video and what's happening in video, not nearly as simple to process either. This is the MarTech landscape that uh, both Matt and Dennis alluded to. This is published every year by Scott Brinker and, uh, and the Third Door Media folks. There's, uh, I think, now 8,000 vendors on here. And if you have a microscope, you might be able to find your logo somewhere. But the problem is not just the tools. It's that every single one of these has its own data, has its own reporting, has its own format. And most of them have a vested interest in not letting you switch. So they make their data hard to get out of these systems. Our third problem we face is a velocity problem, how fast information is coming at us. How many people here uh, are just looking around the room are, are under the age of 30? Just show of hands. And it's okay if you, if you want to lie. Uh, <laughs> if, for example, you were, you were born, say, in 1988, uh, about 30 years ago, you had 1.1 million news stories that year, the year of your birth. Today, we are on track for about 100 million news stories this year. That's just in the news. That's 200,000 news stories a day. Now think about your brand, think about your company. If you get a great story, a great piece of front page coverage in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, you're one of 200,000. And that blip of brief attention goes away faster than ever. I was working with a company uh, a couple years ago, the Consumer Electronics. They got a fantastic front page digital and print uh, coverage of their product right in the middle of Black Friday. They only got 8,000 visits to their website because their story was over like that in an instant. Our fourth problem is veracity, the truthfulness of our data. Now we're talking about fake news. We're talking about problems in the data itself. A few years ago, if you were to type in uh, directions from Topeka to Tokyo, Google Maps told you to kayak across the Pacific Ocean. This is a bad idea. I mean, if, if, you, if you can do it, great, uh, but probably not the best guidance. But yet, if how many of us tr implicitly trust these apps, these systems we're working with, and just assume we're not going to be driven off of a cliff or, or any small boat across the ocean? You know this because every single person in this room has this person in their database. Test at testing.com, right? 
you know you have this person or like 500,000 copies of this person. How trustworthy is your data? A big part of artificial intelligence is being able to trust data. And our last problem is a value problem. What is the value of our digital marketing? Out of curiosity, let's do a quick show of hands. How many people think that of all the, the Fortune 500 CMOs, uh, at least 50% trust their marketing analytics? Show of hands, anyone? Okay, a couple. How many think 40%? 30%? Okay, the 30% folks are about right. It's between 35 and 40% of how many people trust and use the analytics that they're showing. This is from the CMO survey, a biannual survey of, of Fortune 500 CMOs done by Duke University. Think about how much money you're spending on analytics. Think about how much money you're spending on data and storage. And then think about basically two thirds of it for at least our, our corporate peers is wasted. They're not bothering to use it. Right? Just throw it out. Why is this? It's because everyone is stuck at the bottom rung of the hierarchy of analytics. The hierarchy of analytics is a five step chart beginning with the stuff. Can we even find our data? Where is it? I would wager to say 90, 95% of companies are stuck in that red layer. What happened? We still can't explain. What happened? What's, where is our data? I was on a conference call earlier this week talking to a company that had to bring in 14 different people from 12 departments just to find out how many new customers they got in the past year. And by the end of the two hour meeting, they still didn't have an answer. So this is why we don't trust our analytics because this is a lot of work and there's very little value in the data itself in being able to answer what happened. Where you start to create value is being able to ask, why did something happen? Why did a customer make a choice? Why did a customer buy something? That is qualitative research. We have, that's some value there. Once, we, once you have these two things answered, you can start talking about prediction. What will happen? What is likely to happen? If you can answer that, now you start to get value out of your analytics and out of your data. If you can prescribe, if you can know what to do with your data, that's very high value. And almost no one can do that. The good news is, by the way, for everyone in this room, this is why we will all still have jobs because machines can't do this yet. It's a long ways away. And finally, can a machine do it for me? The only person who does that is Jeff Bezos. Bezos. Everyone else, we're, we're, we're not there yet. But this is why we don't trust our analytics because we are st all stuck down here or the majority of us are stuck down here. The consequences of these five problems are catastrophic and often somewhat funny failure. So how do we fix this? Artificial intelligence is one of the solutions that could fix some of these problems. And I say that because there are three basic benefits of AI. And these benefits should sound familiar because they're timeless. The first benefit is acceleration. Can you get to your answers faster? If you've got the data, can you get to the answers faster? With 200,000 news stories a day, you'd better be able to get to the answers faster because you'll run out of lifetime before you run out of the ability to read those stories. Our second benefit is accuracy. Humans are notoriously inaccurate at pretty much everything we do because we're just carbon-based life forms. We, can't, we are not built for crunching numbers. We are built for much more abstract tasks. Machines are really good at crunching numbers. And the third benefit is automation. Can we offload the crap that nobody loves to do? Every single person in this room has at least one task in their job that is boring, repetitive, and you wish would go away. That's one of the main promises of AI. So let's talk about what this stuff is because there's a lot of discussion about AI, but not a whole lot of, hey, this is actually what the thing is. When we think about how things learn, humans, machines, this is a defined process. Harvard, for example, uh, specifies these are the ways human brains develop. First with very basic inputs, sensory inputs, pathways, he vision, hearing, uh, awareness, data. Then you get to language creation and finally to higher cognitive function. For anyone who's a parent of a teenager, I think we all appreciate the fact that cognitive function drops off when they're 13. <laughs> machines are no different. Machines are focused on, we are first building algorithms, using statistics to build algorithms. 
From there, that's where you get to machine learning, where the machines can actually begin to learn from the data they're given. You get to something called deep learning, which is a lot of machine learning stacked together. And eventually, we'll get to here, this general purpose AI. That is when we will have a, an existential crisis, because a machine that becomes self-aware will quickly realize that, for the most part, the human waste is a negative, and will probably try and work us out of the equation. But that's not for a long time. All machine learning begins with statistics and probability. One of the things that is so important for everyone to hear is that AI is math, is not magic. AI is math, not magic. So all of it begins with stats and probability. Once you have the ability to do basic stats, you, begin, you move up to algorithms, and you use algorithms every day. You probably get dressed in the same general way each morning, right? There's a certain article of clothing you put on first. Some people, it's their top, other people, it's their bottom. A few strange people put their socks on first. But pretty much, it's the same thing. It's a repeatable process. Everything you've been using in marketing technology is based on algorithms. These are usually pre-baked. An A-B test runs a very sp a specific type of algorithm. Uh, an email marketing uh, package runs a specific type of algorithm. What it changes is that when you get to machine learning, with the way algorithms are created changes. If you open up your word processor, you are taking a piece of software that was pre-written, algorithm pre-written, and then you do something and it spits out data. The way machine learning works is we take a, a lot of data, give it to a machine and say, you figure out how to do this thing. You figure out how to process the data. You write your own algorithm and then over time improve it. So it's, it's a reverse of the traditional software process. This is why machine learning and artificial intelligence are so different because we're not telling the machine how to do something anymore. We're just telling it what to do. There are two broad categories of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. There's some more nuances in that, but suppose you had a block, a table full of these colorful blocks. In supervised learning, we want to tell the machine what to look for. So in that table of blocks, we would show photos of red colored things to a machine, to enormous numbers of photos saying, this is red, this is red, this is red. And eventually the machine learns, okay, that's red. And then every new block that we feed it, it can say yes or no, this is likely a red block. Supervised learning is one of the basic, uh, most powerful things we can use in marketing to get better answers. A very famous non-marketing example is uh, IBM Watson uses uh, supervised learning for oncology, for cancer diagnosis. There's a very famous story a few years back about where they had a woman in the University of Tokyo who uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. She wasn't getting better, and so they sequenced her genome and fed the, her genome to Watson along with 233,000 journals of oncology and said, Watson, figure out what's wrong. Identify, uh, based on, this, on, on the data, what has happened. And what happened was the doctors were treating the wrong type of leukemia. They were treating a different type. The woman made a full recovery. Now, that alone is pretty cool, but Watson did it in 11 minutes. That's even cooler because, again, accuracy and acceleration. The second type of machine learning is called unsupervised learning, where instead of saying, hey, we want to look for the color red, we say, hey, we've got a lot of blocks. How can we organize these? How can we categorize them? Now, there's a, there's a few blocks on this table. There's, what, about 15 on the table? Now, imagine a table of 15 billion blocks. There's absolutely no way you could categorize all of them. But a machine can. A machine could say, well, we can sort these by colors, we can sort them by shapes, we can sort them by sizes, and know what's inside the bag, know what, what to make of a large set of data. When we look at marketing applications, I had uh, a client meeting and I was getting ready for a client meeting and I needed to take 2,600 articles and tell the client what was being said about them. So using unsupervised learning, a uh, technology called topic modeling, we reduced it down to one chart so that I could walk into the meeting and say, hey, here's what people actually think about you. Unfortunately for the client, nobody liked them, but we were able to get the answer very, very quickly using unsupervised learning, what's in the box. Think about all the data that you have access to every single day. You have photos, you have video, you have audio, you have text. <clears throat> unsupervised learning helps unlock the value of all of that data. As I said, machine learning is mostly math and statistics. These are just a few of the names of these things, but the important thing to understand is that it is still math. It is not magic. AI cannot create something from nothing. Right? It has to come from somewhere, and that from somewhere is your data. 
The third type of machine learning is something called deep learning. And this has bec become the most uh, talked about type of machine learning. It's also probably the one that is most obscure and also the most susceptible to um, unusual behaviors. If you were to take every single technique that we just showed of machine learning, start gluing them together like uh, chains or Legos or a stack of pancakes, you would get what's called deep learning, where the data flows from one layer to the next, changing each time until you get an outcome that is far better than any one machine learning itself can deliver. This creates technologies that think like us, but better, faster, and cheaper. How many of you use the Google Translate service? Okay, a fair number of you. Google Translate, about two years ago, in fact, exactly two years ago, because it was November 2016, changed their algorithm. They had previously had sort of a one-to-one -one match. Like if uh, you say um, uh, butterfly, it knows butterfly equals mariposa in Spanish, but it, it contextually, it never really understood the connections. So Google, wanting to improve the accuracy of their translation, fed 130 languages to its deep learning service, DeepMind, and said, you figure out how human language works. It reverse engineered all the languages and came up with a meta model, a language, a proto language underneath our languages. So now when you use Google Translate, you go from English to Google to Spanish or Dutch to Google to Korean. That translation layer, that machine layer, results in much, much better translations, far better than any older style algorithm could do. Deep learning allows this, makes this possible. So when we talk about the landscape of AI, it looks like this. You begin with stats, you, have, you move to algorithms, you start doing machine learning where you have that first transition of machines learn from the data and then deep learning. The reason it's important to know this is largely because it's a good BS detector. A lot of the times you're going to see, a whole bunch, you're going to see every marketing technology company on the planet saying they have AI in their, in their product or service. Some of them do, some of them have really good AI, some of them have crap. Uh, some of them have things like basic linear regressions, then they're calling it a a AI. <laughs> Technically, maybe, but it's not going to deliver the, the acceleration, the accuracy, or the automation that you're looking for. So having some knowledge of this allows you to chat with vendors and say, what have you actually got in the box? When you look at how these technologies map to the hierarchy of analytics, it gives you a sense of where your company is on its readiness for AI. If you are still trying to figure out where the data is, you need to focus mostly on quantitative marketing technologies like Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics. Where is our stuff? If you, are, if you know where your stuff is and you need to explain why things happened, then you start looking at the quality of things, focus groups, market research, etc. When you get into predictive analytics, you start, now you're getting into actual statistics and the beginnings of machine learning. It's only once you get into prescriptive and deep learning that you are really digging deep into, into AI toolbox. Until then, you should be working on these technologies to make sure that you're good at them as an organization. AI is good at solving some problems and bad at solving a bunch of others. So let's talk very briefly about these. But in 2010, uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld famously said, there are the known knowns and the unknown unknowns, and a whole bunch of people laughed at him. Um, about whatever it was he was talking about at the time, but it was a really good example of classifying problems. When you know, when you have known knowns, you know what you know and you know how to solve it. AI is really good at that. AI is really taking a problem and finding a solution based on the existing data that you have. So that's a great application for AI. When you don't know what you know, which is, by the way, is every company that has massive data silos, you don't, you, AI is not going to be able to help you solve those problems. Those are governance problems. You have governance problems and you need to fix those before you can turn those unknowns into knowns. If you know what you don't know, for example, you're trying to do new product development or you're looking for uh, answers within your data, this is more of a data science problem than it is an AI problem. You need to know what you don't know and to figure out what you don't know. Bring in third party data, uh, engineer your data to give better answers. Finally, in the unknown unknowns, where you don't know what you don't know, AI is not applicable. That is the reason why we are still employed, to be able to solve these problems, to, to the, uh, the ones that require true creativity. AI is bad at empathy. It can simulate it. It can simulate understanding of sentiment and emotion, but machines cannot feel yet. I'm saying this in 2018 because who knows what's going to happen. Uh, machines are bad at judgment that requires complex inputs. Again. They're only as good as the data we put into them. So if our judgment is poor, uh, 
and historically uh, companies have not done as good as they could have, of course a, a machine is going to spit out the same kind of poor judgments. Machines cannot do general life experience, nor can they work with true human to human relationships unless your customer experience is so terrible that a machine is preferable. Even a mediocre experience is terrible. So um, I don't think there's anyone here from the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? <laughs> That's an example where we would be thrilled to talk to a machine as opposed to a surly human who's just going to yell at us. So let's look at some practical utility examples of how AI is being used today. Um, not future gazing, but actual applications. Four categories, content, lead targeting, conversion, and intelligence. In content marketing, AI, particularly unsupervised learning, has enormous benefits right now. One of the things that you can do with text mining, with this topic modeling and, and language understanding, is reverse engineer Google. Google search results are powered by DeepMind. No one, including Google, has any idea how Google actually delivers search results. But we can use our own AI to reverse engineer some of those results and get a sense of, okay, these are the top pages that rank for these terms. What do they all have in common? What characteristics are there? And give us a checklist. It, to rank similarly, let's try at least extracting out these characteristics and put them into play. So this was an example we did for um, uh, digital marketing. Like, What are the terms, when someone talks about digital marketing, what are the terms that are most prominent on all the pages that rank well for it? And if you come up with these things, okay, now we can start building out a, a content strategy using those same types of terms and language. Another example is brand identification for content, understanding what is associated with your brand. When someone types in marketing into, uh, or actually, no, let's say these were articles, uh, 230,000 230, articles about digital marketing. We said, what is most commonly associated with the term marketing? And out of those articles, there were things like leading, helping, packaging, understanding, digital marketing, and so on and so forth. We did this earlier in the year for a, a brand. We said, okay, let's take 500,000 mentions of your brand. What are the words and phrases that are most closely associated with your brand name? What do you have a right to talk about versus what are the things that are unclear? Uh, for the term analytics, the, one of the, in the most recent 70,000 news articles on analytics, one of the top terms was manalytics, which is the most ridiculous thing in the world, by the way. This is a statement in sports analytics where someone's saying, well, I, I as, a, as a man understand better than any machine what, I, well, you know, what, what to really pick for a sports team. It's like, good luck, you're going to get killed. <laughs> <clears throat> but it gives us a sense very quickly of understanding what a topic is about and then being able to create content around it. So content marketing is one of the prime applications for machine learning today. When it comes to lead targeting, how do you understand who it is that you should be talking to? For example, I was at a, uh, an event not too long ago with a marketing process forum, and we just did a scan of all the conversations around this. There were about 20,000 conversations and tried to identify who were the people who were most talked about. And this gave us an influencer map to be able to then get out in, into, into the community and recruit people, recruit influencers, recruit prime customers, things like that. Now imagine your brand, who are the people who are most talked about in relation to your brand? Those could be customers, those definitely are going to be influencers, and people who can change minds about your brand. The nice thing is it's not just cool charts, you actually get usable data, you load it into your marketing automation system, identify people by who, what they say they're about, and off you go. Another example when it comes to lead conversion is the infamous chatbot. If you haven't already played around with chatbots, you really should because it's not nearly as difficult as it looks. This is one, this is from a company called ChatFuel and you just drag and drop blocks together and then this, in this particular one, this one talks to uh, people who go to our Facebook page and at least helps them with the most commonly asked questions like what kind of email would you like to leave? This helps you, this can be used for lead qualification, especially. Is this a good customer for high value transactions? When it comes to conversion, machine learning, particularly um, statistical, heavy statistical machine learning, is your best friend. <clears throat> attribution analysis is one of the, challenge, the biggest challenges marketers face. And even in the digital space, the attribution tools that are out there are not great. So, using a technology, uh, type of uh, machine learning called Markov chains, which is basically digital Jenga, where you just take every conversion, start pulling out blocks and see if the conversion falls apart or not, simulating them. Uh, we did this for a company where we wanted to figure out what 
really drove conversions. If you pulled this block out, the conversion fell apart the most. And this, for this company, it was their email marketing. They thought, they thought it was their public relations. They, they thought it was the, all the positive press, but it was actually their email marketing was the number one thing. And the number two thing for them was comments on their blog. We didn't expect that, like why was it? But they've done a, such a good job of creating a community that if you were to take away their blog comments, their conversions would collapse. They would simply have no, no good chance of reaching conversions. Another fun aspect, the thing we, we found for them was Twitter drove a tremendous amount of conversions for them, but they were putting all their money and time in Facebook. They're like, Facebook's a thing. No, no, it's not. Twitter's a thing for you. Facebook's way down here. So being able to do this kind of attribution analysis with machine learning technology gives you better answers to help you prioritize budget, resources, and strategy. This technology, by the way, does not require massive uh, server farms or big iron. I run this on my laptop. And the fourth thing is intelligence, being able to make good decisions about what it is you're about to do using machine learning. This is a fun one. We took uh, the, all the cheeses. So any Monty Python fans will recognize all the cheese names from the cheese shop sketch. But all the cheeses and forecasted over the next 52 weeks, when are searches for those cheeses likely to increase the most? So when we did this initially, it was uh, uh, mozzarella. And then by September, it, oh no, so it was halloumi early in the summer, because apparently halloumi is a cheese that you can grill. Uh, and then it moved to mozzarella. And right now, it's I think in November, it's cheddar and remains cheddar, I, I think, until the new year. But it gives you, it's a kind of a fun, silly example of being able to forecast forward and make plans based on your data. This is a fun one. When will people be, set, be reading their email? If you look at how often someone searches for something like out of office template, Outlook out of office, things like that, they're doing so because they want to know how to turn the feature on so they can go on vacation, right? So if you reverse that and say, when do people search for that for the least, there are very specific periods of time when those searches bottom out. And so those are the times when you as a marketer should be sending email and maybe even running paid ads to influence it. So by quarter, it's gonna be the week of January 13th, April tw the week of April 21st, the week of September 15th, and the week of October 27th. Those will be the next big weeks when you should be sending email, and by the way, any other digital campaigns, to take advantage of the fact that people have their butts in their seats in the office. <clears throat> Likewise, don't send email during those dates. Everyone got the photo that they wanted. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be big stuff. It can be then down to your brand name. So uh, I took a look at the attendee list this morning. And, and uh, by the way, did you know the Google Photos app on your phone has text recognition? You take a picture of the attendee schedule, and it'll transcribe it all, and then you can put and copy and paste that. I did that this morning. I took all of your, your company brand names and put them into this forecast to see when are people going to search for things like Assurant or Air Liquide or Campbell's Soup over the next 52 weeks. First by trend to help you figure out, okay, when is something going to peak? And then by actual search volume, like this is, if Chevrolet were to get, for example, 100% uh, of the searches about it, it would have 50, 60, 70,000 uh, visitors a week. Now imagine using this to plan your content, your budget, your advertising, your staffing, maybe even your customer service. When are people searching for specific terms about you? That's how you use machine learning in a very practical way. Not some pie in the sky. It's, no, this week we're going to do this, and we know 50 weeks in advance when something's going to happen, so we can budget for it appropriately. The most important thing with machine learning is to get started now. The reason why is that machine learning is based on data. The sooner you collect data, the more of an advantage you have, because without that data, Every day that you wait is a day of less of data you have to train your models with. So by starting early, you'll have that information that you need in order to train the machines. How do you get started? There's a journey to artificial intelligence. There's a way to build up to it. The journey begins with that strong data foundation. Can you find your data? Can, is it clean? Is it well prepared? Is it ready for analysis? If you know where your data is, then your next step on your journey is to become data-driven, to use the data you already have. Do you have KPIs set? Are they connected to reality? Uh, do you understand what happened? After that, you have to be able to explain why. Why are the things happening? So you need qualitative capabilities. You need market research capabilities. There are entirely too many companies who believe that if you have quantitative data, you have enough to make decisions. No amount of quantitative data will ever tell you why something happened. Only qualitative data tells you that. 
Your fourth step on your journey is to build process automation. And this is with or without AI. This is just getting more bandwidth internally in your organization and thinking algorithmically. When you approach a problem, do you approach a problem as I need to solve this problem now or I need to build a repeatable solution that will work in perpetuity? So many organizations don't do this. The fifth step in your AI journey is building that data science foundation. Can you find the known unknowns? Can you solve the unknown knowns? Do you have math and stats capabilities, code and engineering capabilities, data architects within your organization? If you don't, you need to build those first because you can't build a strong AI program until you have those data science fundamentals. You deploy machine learning with process, advanced process automation with data science, powering supervised and unsupervised learning uh, and some reinforcement learning. And eventually you become an AI powered enterprise where you solve for AI first. Every problem you tackle, you look at, can we use artificial intelligence to do this first? There are probably five companies on the planet right now that are there and they're all Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook and IBM. Right? Everybody else, we need to catch up to them to where they're going. When it comes to the question of should I buy from a vendor or should I build AI capabilities in-house, the answer is a, a definite maybe. The three pillars are time, money, and strategy. If you've got money but you don't have time, a vendor will help you get up to speed fast at the cost of a lot of money, right? Because they have the solution prepackaged, off you go. Very straightforward. And there's, I can see there's like AI posters even back in, the, in the, the table area over there. So there are plenty of vendors that will help you get up to speed very, very quickly. If you don't have the money but you got the time, look at building in-house capabilities, learning, training, growing your, your capabilities. All the examples that I've shown today of the practical applications are stuff that's using open source software. So there's no financial cost. It's just the knowledge cost and the time it takes to build that. Budget about two years a person to get up to speed on a lot of these technologies. But time and money is, are the easy answers. The most difficult answer is the strategy question. What is your company's digital strategy? There's a very popular buzzword for this. It's called digital transformation. Um, and it promises unicorns and puppies and rainbows and hugs and teddy bears and, and, and magic wonders of delight. But it's as much hype as there is, digital transformation has real meaning in that it is transforming your organization to be digital first. This is really important because when you look at artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence fits within the MarTech governance framework. This framework is, uh, ba is based on an ISO standard, and if you think about marketing technology, in a large organization, you should be doing every single thing here. Strategy, your balance sheet, acquisition, operations, risk and compliance, uh, uh, change management. The one I want to call your attention to is that balance sheet layer here. Let's make that bigger. If you are pursuing digital transformation, for real, one of the most important things that's going to change in your business is how you treat data. Data is not just a, a, a cost center or a thing. Data becomes an asset. Data shows up on your balance sheet as something that has real financial and revenue repercussion. And then the things you do with that data are the transformation. If you are building machine learning models on top of your data, you're creating a, a separate line of business. Think about, if, for example, you're a coffee company and you, I mean, you manage coffee trees, right? You're collecting data about the climate and the growing conditions and all those things, and you build a machine learning model to predict, okay, what coffee trees are likely to succeed or fail? If you are a digitally transformed company, you now have that data, which you could use for your own coffee trees or resell to other companies, but you now have a machine learning model to predict what coffee trees grow. You can literally pick that model up and move it over here and say, let's deploy it for corn. Can we use the exact same model to predict corn growth or to predict rice growth or even to predict silly things like virtual crops in video games? Any of these things, you can take that model and move it around if you are a digitally first company. And so when it comes to building or buying in-house, if you are a digital first company, you have to build in-house. You have to build a house because no matter how good the vendor is, if you want to be able to build and sell your own models, you must have the capability internally. 
So if you're approaching AI from a utility perspective, I just want faster, better, cheaper, go ahead and buy. There's no reason not to. A vendor will be more than happy to solve that problem for you. If you want that transformation, you must build. You absolutely must build. Where do you build? The Magi, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and IBM are all companies that have great platforms that you can use to get started. Most of them uh, follow the freemium model where they, it's, it's easy to get started and becomes egregiously expensive almost overnight. <laughs> but they work, they work really well. If you want to deep dive, these are the two languages that you need to start with and that you need to look for and hire for. People who are proficient in one or both of these, these are the foundations of modern machine learning. To get started, one thing I would recommend you do is pilot a project for fun internally within your company. Pick something, anything, and analyze the crap out of it. Here's a fun example. I took uh, 1.6 million posts on medium.com, the publishing platform, and said what corresponds, to, what correlates with claps, their, that's their version of likes. It turns out more than anything, it's just how long your post is. Right, that, that, we ran this through a, a, a vectorization model and all it turns out was at the end of the day, longer is better on Medium. And almost nothing else, like the topics or the tags or the things that people write about matters nearly as much as just make really, really long posts. So this is a fun example. On sites like Kaggle.com or data.gov, there are data sets that you can download and play with for free to teach yourself machine learning and to have some fun exploring applications you can then use for your business. How do you prepare your company for artificial intelligence? You're gonna need three kinds of people. You're gonna need, well, data is the new oil is an expression I like a lot because if you've ever worked with crude oil, it's nasty, disgusting stuff. It's completely useless, right? It just makes it stains on everything it touches. In order to make data, to make oil useful, you have to extract it, refine it, and deploy it to the market. Data is exactly the same way, right? Data locked away in all your databases is completely unhelpful. You need to extract it, refine it, and deploy it to market. And the three kinds of people you need are developers, data scientists, and marketing technologists. The developers are the folks who can connect to all those databases, writing code and pulling data from all the systems and getting it into one place with it. API after API, you know, various bits of code, middleware, whatever it is. And that's a very specific skill set. Data scientists are the ones who then take all that raw data and refine it, transform it, clean it up, turn it into a working model, and then create outputs from that model. And then for us, as marketing technologists, we have to take those insights and deploy them to market, actually use them to change the business. This is where almost everybody goes wrong. Right? Companies spend a lot of money on data scientists, they spend a lot of money in development, and nobody ever takes the findings and uses them. Right? The CMO survey said, um, you okay? Uh, two thirds of that data never gets used. So how do you prepare your career for artificial intelligence? First, you need multidisciplinary skills. You need to be good at more than one thing. These are the top 10 most in-demand hard skills for in 2018 according to LinkedIn. Any one of these disciplines is something that you can automate a substantial part of. You can automate a substantial part of SEO for example. What you can't do is automate things that are cross discipline So if you're really good at stats, and you're really good at data presentation, and you're really good at network security, you are a very difficult person to replace. So the more you can do to replace and upgrade your skills and be across disciplines, the better you'll do. The second is to learn to think algorithmically. Learn to think like a machine. How do you solve, approach a problem from the beginning as I want to write a routine, a process that will solve this problem? You don't need to code. You need to think like a coder though. The third thing that you need to do to prepare your career is to learn how to oversee the machines, to be a quality checker. AI is math, not magic, which means that what you put in is what we get out. In some cases, what we get out is absolute garbage. In 2017, ProPublica did an expose on a police department in Georgia that attempted to write a predictive model predicting who would be, a, who would be likely to re-offend their model came up with 20% accuracy. You'd be better off flipping a coin. But their model predicted that African Americans would reoffend five times more than they actually did. Someone put their thumb on the scale and said, I want the algorithm to spit out a bias. Right? So our job as marketers, our job as people in working with data is to be able to spot bias 
and intercept it and fix it as quickly as possible. Just three months ago, Amazon got in an enormous amount of trouble because their AI-based hiring system discriminated against women systemically. Why? Because they've only been hiring guys for the last 10 years, and so the machine logically said, okay, we're gonna hire more guys. Well, no, we need to be the ones to say that's a bias, and the actual outcome should look like this. And this is a, going to be a career for the, like, the next five or 10 years. We have to be outcome focused as people. Don't worry about the coding part. This is a, a chart I kept in my cubicle for a number of years. I was trying to learn the individual pieces of deep learning. And then I went to IBM Think this year and they said, oh, you know this whole really complex thing you've been trying to teach yourself for two years? We made it drag and drop. Ah, thanks. <laughs> And so I don't need to learn how to write the code, but I do need to learn how to do the thinking and decide what blocks to drag and drop together, and the machines will do the heavy lifting for us. In the future, there are gonna be two kinds of jobs. Either you are gonna manage the machines or the machines are going to manage you, that's it. There is nothing else in the future. This is actually not even the future, this is today. I was at the supermarket the other day and I was watching this guy pushing his cleaning cart and he had those little like, zappers like you see when you're, when you're doing the self-checkout thing. And he walked to the beginning of an aisle and sort of zapped the thing, the uh, coat at the top of the rack, walked to the other end of the aisle, zap that end over there and keep going. And I'm like, what is he doing? And then I realized he's being tracked by a machine. He has to check in at the beginning and end of every aisle. And if he goes too fast, he skips some stuff. If he goes too slow, he's not productive enough. And so the machines are measuring everything. Your machines are doing this right now across your organization. We want to be the people who manage the machines, not the people who are being managed by them, because it's a much, much more uh, interesting future. So with that, I have a couple minutes left for questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions. Sir. For new product launches, it depends on your product management life cycle. So do you, are you talking for developing the product itself or for marketing an existing product that you've just made? For, for product development, one of the things that you need to do that is fascinating is actually ask your customers what they want or listen to your customers. We did a project earlier this year, uh, took 29 years of call center transcripts from this company that was stored in their CRM and did text mining on it and said, what are the things that people are asking you about that you probably aren't paying attention to? You can do it with customer service inboxes, call centers and stuff like that. For them, uh, they make a, a beverage thickeners, uh, which is interesting. I didn't know there are so many ways to thicken a beverage. But the two beverages they were being asked about that they'd never even heard of, and neither did I, was oat milk and hemp milk. I, again, I didn't even know these existed, but apparently they're a thing. They're a particular thing for people who are vegan, and they don't stay together very well. So this company now had two new opportunities to develop products for um, that they went in and did. The second thing is when you're, you're talking about taking a product that you have a known solution for, Doing competitive analysis using, again, the, the similar types of either text mining or uh, driver analysis, which is like attribution analysis, to say, here's what everyone else in our space is talking about or, or trying to solve. What's the overlap between what we say the product can solve versus what the, the customer base or the competitors are saying about the same thing, and where's their green space for us to be able to, to bring something new to market? That's a lot harder. That requires... Um, human intervention at almost every stage because you have to have that broad domain expertise. There's, you just can't bake that in the machines. But those are two examples where, where this is being used today. Other questions? Sir. Oh, here's the microphone. Okay. It's a two-parter. Uh, the first one is if you were building data science department from scratch at a company, how would you start out in building it? And then the second one is data science is becoming more prevalent in companies. There's also kind of a certain demeanor or culture in data science departments. How do you think that's impacting the larger companies where they're getting elevated and kind of what's happening to culture as data science is getting elevated? So the first question about building data science capabilities from scratch, you still have to have that alignment with the overall strategic direction of the company. A lot of companies are approaching data science and AI as, as magic and shiny objects, and what people are doing isn't necessarily aligned to an actual business outcome. So for, the first thing is figure out what the, you know, the business outcome is. If, you, if digital transformation is it, then, then there's a whole bunch of things that go along with that. The toughest part for building that capability is going to be the talent. 
getting a hold of talent is extremely difficult. There are, uh, in 2017, I, f I think it was Deloitte said, there are 8,500 qualified data scientists in the US um, with four years or more of experience. And there are 14,500 marine biologists. So more people know about whales than data science. You have to grow that talent in a lot of cases. So it's, it's taking people who have an aptitude for data and analysis and growing those capabilities with them and then using some vendor partners to augment as you build people into those data scientists. Unless you've got millions and millions of dollars laying around, then you say, okay, sure, we'll spend half a million dollars for, uh, per data scientist for a team. Um, the second question is data and culture are not necessarily uh, exclusive, right? You can be a data-driven culture and still retain aspects of humanity. I personally don't like the human race, um, so my answer has, comes from a very specific perspective, but you, the data science is good for answering lots of questions. What the most important thing to do is to develop a questioning culture so that there's stuff for data scientists to do. So instead of getting the weekly PowerPoint and looking at it going, okay, our numbers are up 4%, cool, move on to the next you know, pile of papers is for people to get in the habit of saying, okay, well, why? What's happening behind the scenes? What's in this? What could make this work better? And again, a lot of companies have built this sort of a culture of in-curiosity. We don't really care um, why something happens. We just want the number and then move on to the next fire to put out. So using, uh, data science has to go along with that aptitude of curiosity. And that is something that you can only really hire for. It's very difficult to make an in-curious person more curious. Good. Hi. We are a hybrid of buy and build. So we have uh, our own models built in-house. Mm -hmm. And we have a list of vendors, uh, about 10 plus vendors we work with for AI models for various business units. As a data provider, uh, I keep spending most of my time educating all the external vendors about our business model, our philosophy, so they can build the right models. Today my struggle is uh, being a proponent to make it build so I can keep the knowledge in-house. I have this uh, great challenge to educate my internal stakeholders to say wean off from the external vendor learning process and go adopt into the internal build model. What is the best strategy for me to actually transition into a build model completely? To transition for, to a build model completely, uh, a big chunk of that is going to start with your, your governance and your data foundation. So IBM has a product uh, called Cloud Private for Data, which extracts data from all these different sources and slaps it into one place. And then if you're doing sort of that public-private cloud hybrid, you'll, you'll take that data and replicate it internally to your own systems. And that's, at that point, once you've got your data flows in place, you can then start building the models on that. But you have to get all that data from all the sources into one place first, and that's really, really difficult. There's an entire industry now um, called customer data platforms that are, are charging egregious sums of money to, to do more or less that, but a lot of the, the legacy tech vendors do have that capability as well. Once you have the data in place, a big part of, of AI is also governance. Like what models, if you go back to that, that chart of, of MarTech governance, your models have to fit within that broader perspective of your overall strategy and then your marketing technology strategy. And that's where you're going to define the outputs that you want your models to be able to address. If you have that, then, then once you start building it or re-importing those models from external sources, uh, it gets much easier to, to advance that cause. If you look in some of the big uh, providers like Watson Studio for IBM has the ability to actually export the entire model and then you can take that and run it somewhere else. So you could take um, uh, a model you built in Watson Studio, transform it to a TensorFlow model and say, now we're going to run that solely within house. But at the end of the day, it always comes back to sort of people, process, and platform. You sounds like you've got the platform. The, you have some of the processes and, and vendors can help you streamline those processes, but the people are the hardest part. Again, humanity, the worst. <laughs> Other questions? So speaking of humanity, can you go a little deeper on sort of how to deal with bias, how to deal with bias within data? I, I can. I'm going to first recommend there's a free book on Amazon called Ethics for Data Science by Dr. Hilary Mason. It is mandatory reading for anybody who is doing any kind of work in data science because it contains things like practical checklists for stuff you have to do to do a data science project well. 
There are four types of bias in machine learning. Now, this human bias is galore. There's like 40 or 50 types of human bias because we suck. But in the machine world, <clears throat> there's four types of bias. There are, there's intentional bias, the example, you can put your thumb on the scale. That's typically the easiest to spot because the outcome looks completely off. Um, and that's something that happens all the time. I used to work at a company in Atlanta. We, uh, it's a 75 person company, not a single African American person on staff. Like, well, Atlanta's 56% black, so you have a bias. Um, very, very easy to spot. The second is called target bias. Target bias is where you're trying to, to use data that itself is corrupted because the target is corrupted. Uh, again, African American healthcare data is useless, completely useless because there's such a systemic societal bias against African Americans that all of the healthcare outcomes are wrong. You have to create an ideal outcome and then optimize for that. The third type of bias is called source bias. And source bias is uh, the data in the system itself is corrupted in some way, and you have to be able to find it to, to see the bias within the system. So, a really good example is social media data. Twitter has a distinct bias as a network. It, it, it skews towards minorities, it skews towards lower income um, and Russian bots. And knowing what the bias of that data allows you to compensate for it. And the last kind of bias is um, tool bias, and that is where you have limitations uh, in the software that you're using that you don't necessarily know of, but are processing limitations. Uh, a fun example is, you ever see that picture on Instagram, that one friend who like, posts pictures of themselves on the beach, and they got the, the beverage and the, 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 you know, the umbrella and stuff, and it looks, it's a perfect picture, and then the text says, well, this sucks, right? You've seen that photo, maybe, um, uh, maybe I have friends who go to the beach a lot. Um, but all the influence marketing software tends to look just at the text, and so it would assume that that's a negative post, when quite clearly it's the opposite. There's a bias in that the software can't digest what it's looking at. So th those are the four classes of bias, and you need to be looking for each one. So I believe we are out of time, but so thank you so much. And we'll make, uh, we're gonna make the recordings and stuff. Want help solving your company's data analytics and digital marketing problems? Visit trustinsights.ai today and let us know how we can help you.